welcome everybody to our discussion about temperature rising, uh, the climate uh, emergency, uh, and one of the pressing issues of contemporary world. I'm uh, really happy that uh, we are uh, able to discuss it uh, with our uh, distinguished guests today. And I would like to introduce uh, you uh, to them and then start, um, start our conversation. Um, I will start with Navros Dubash. Navros is a professor at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. And uh, you conduct their uh, research and write on climate change, energy, air pollution, water policy, and the politics of uh, regulation in the developing world. Um, I think it's quite important in this uh, setting that uh, Dubash has been actively engaged in the climate debate as a scholar, policy advisor, and activist for 25 years already. So you are a certain generation of uh, uh, climate activists, uh, and you are, so to say, representing today yourself and this generation as well. Um, and he was instrumental in establishing the Global Climate Action Network in 1990. Um, and since uh, um, then, uh, you've written uh, widely about climate politics, policy, and governance. And um, important, I think, for this conversation is that you are coordinating lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and um, you have edited a book, India in a Warming World, and it's available for free download. So if you want to learn more about India and climate change, uh, you're, uh, you're um, welcome to Google and uh, download the book. Uh, the second on the panel uh, is Tobias Reuss. He's uh, head of sustainability strategy Volkswagen brand. Um, you are based in Berlin, uh, Tobias. You're industrial engineer and former management consultant. Um, and you plan the sustainability strategy of the Volkswagen brand. Um, your vision, CO2 neutral mobility for all. I think we will dwell upon that. I'm very interested what you have to say about that. And uh, the core uh, of your work uh, was uh, and is the reduction of CO2 over the entire life cycle. So uh, by a life cycle, we mean the life cycle um, of, the aut uh, of the automobile, uh, of the car, from the extraction of raw materials and the, to the recycling of a vehicle. And uh, the most recent projects um, that you are dealing with are electric ve vehicles uh, produced in a net CO2 neutral way. Uh, and uh, you are a trained life coach, which is, as I assume, uh, quite helpful with your work. And last but not least, Chloe Swarbrick, politician. Um, you represent um, a totally different generation of uh, politicians. You were one of the youngest politicians in the New Zealand Parliament, voted for the New Zealand Parliament. You are MP for Auckland Central, New Zealand. Uh, Chloe grew up in a family that, uh, as you can see with, uh, when you watch her speeches, uh, raised her on a diet of robust and challenging discussion in a community that showed uh, Chloe that the inequality and injustice were a daily reality for too many New Zealanders. Uh, Chloe has been a law student, journalist, business owner, and a community project leader. And um, uh, as a journalist, you were interviewing politicians and you realized you have to go into politics yourself uh, because, uh, 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 because the, the politicians that you were talking to were really absolutely uh, um, uh, out of sync uh, um, uh, with the uh, constituencies and the lives of uh, normal people. And um, I would like to show one video, Chloe, or last but not least because of this reason, uh, so I would like uh, everybody to watch a short video that you actually became famous for. Mr. Speaker, how many world leaders for how many decades have seen and known what is coming, but have decided that it is more politically expedient to keep it behind closed doors? My generation and the generations after me do not have that luxury. In the year 2050, I will be 56 years old. Yet, right now, the average age of this 52nd parliament is 49 years old. Okay, boomer. 
Uh, current political institutions have proven themselves incompetent of thinking outside of a short political term. We just showed you uh, in the uh, parliament um, uh, with um, a famous statement, oh, okay, Boomer, uh, that you responded to a comment um, of another MP that disrupted your, um, um, your speech. Uh, and the speech was on climate change and uh, climate emergency. And Chloe, I would like to start from here because we are in Weimar Symposium and the, the, the topic of this symposium is generations. Is it actually right to frame climate crisis in this as an intergenerational conflict? We have it because of Fridays for Future. We have it because of uh, so many young people now engaging uh, in the um, in the climate uh, uh, emergency movement against the you know the climate change and climate crisis, so could you could you uh, based on your speech could you tell us what was your approach and what is your approach as a politician? Is it really mm. like intergenerational uh, conflict and problem? No. <laughs> Uh, so, kia ora, um, thank you so much for having me on the panel. Um, there is a lot to unpack, and I think it's really important to note that no one person can be defined by two words, let alone by whatever is projected onto that or extrapolated from that. Uh, to give you some context, uh, that is obviously an extract from a speech that I gave in support of the what is colloquially known as the Zero Carbon Formally Bill, now Act, now New Zealand Parliament. That is a piece of legislation which was fought for by a very for a very long time by Greens, uh, you know, for the past three decades, but also uh, by all of the school strikers and a number of the different NGO NGO groups that came to support those young people. Uh, that quip came about because in framing my uh, contribution to that debate after having sat on the Environment Select Committee and pulling it apart from submissions from all sectors of society, whether they were industry through to civil society, through to local government or otherwise, and young, old and middle-aged people who were concerned about their children's future and their own. Uh, I was speaking about the year 2050, which is when uh, this all going well will come into effect, this piece of legislation. Uh, in the year 2050, given that I'm born in 1994, I will be 56 years old. And I was speaking to how at present, in one of the many different ways that you can look at things that influence our political decision makers and their decision making, uh, that is not too far away, that age of 56 is not too far away from the average age of our parliament at present which in turn perhaps informs some of the lack of sense of urgency that is felt. You know, you mentioned that younger people in particular are incredibly concerned that they are inheriting a climate change future, that is their retirement. And while I was speaking about this and the sense of concern that I have for raising children in that environment, I was being heckled, that is yelled at constantly in a barrage about the fact that I was raising that age and uh, my experiences as a younger person. And I responded in turn. And it's one of those responses that uh, lights a fire of all of these assumptions about supposed intergenerational warfare. But I think it's important to remember that that sense of pent up frustration and that very relatively polite response, given what I was having thrown at me, is actually a pretty robust given the amount of times that I particularly as a younger politician and having to fight my way into this space have consistently been told that I know nothing and that I don't have a place here and that I've had to validate and legitimize myself in a way that others that do not possess this demographic this characteristic do not so I guess just in summarizing all of that and contributing to you know trying to answer your question I uh, I really do recognize all of the work that's been done by my forebears, particularly in the green movement, because they have you know, gone from a space where 30 years ago, it was wild, it was perceived as insane to be talking about something like global warming or climate change. The fact that we can now have relatively rational conversations about it is all by virtue of their work. But the other thing about age is that actually nobody has youth forever. And if we look at the chronology of human evolution, particularly socially and politically, it has largely been aligned with youth and student political movements. So in the same way that I won't be young forever, I'm now looking to those Zoomers, for lack of a better term, who are pushing me forwards, uh, lest I become complacent.
Okay, so you basically say your response were more about age bias that you were facing, uh, but in a way, still this there is a there is a, uh, an energy. Uh, I don't want to say conflict, but there is a pushing and energy uh, coming your way already from younger mm -hmm. people uh, to do something in uh, in terms of uh, changing uh, uh, the the policies uh, of. And, and I just yeah, to, to unpack that, I don't think that conflict or differences of ideas or critique needs to be perceived as a negative thing. You know, that tension is necessary to drive human innovation and mm -hmm. creative thinking. Uh, so those differences in perspective and one of the inherent life experiences that younger people have, particularly in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is growing up in a world where they know that their natural resources, particularly our waterways, are not what they once were, that they're inheriting a climate change future and the likes of the housing crisis and the job market gig economy being what it is. So all I'm simply saying is that perspective is valuable and that conflict needn't blow up into something which is completely non-constructive. Yeah. Um, Navros, I need to ask you, uh, with your uh, experience of uh, many years of... Uh, uh, not only activism, but uh, as well, you know, advisor uh, uh, po policy making. Um, what is, in your opinion, uh, the conflict line? And I'm, I don't want to. I'm do I use the the word conflict not to, you know, build uh, uh, two uh, different, you know, or differentiate between the groups, but just to just to understand. What are we actually fighting for here? Um, and what are the strategies then, uh, the possible strategies of solid solidarity maybe be between the groups uh, and between the generations? So from your really very concrete experience, uh, what, what would you, what would you uh, give us here and as an example? Well, thank you, uh, Catherine. And first of all, thanks for having me uh, as part of this conversation. I'm delighted to be here with Chloe and, and Tobias and look forward to hearing them some more. Uh, a little bit like Chloe, I want to sort of resist the um, uh, uh, the, the labeling of, of me as a representative, not just of, of sort of the developing world, but also, uh, you know, you very graciously suggested I could speak for this whole generation of people who've been banging around trying to think about climate change for, for a couple of decades. And I, again, uh, uh, like Chloe, I think there are many different perspectives within generations, within geographies. Um, uh, but, but again, speaking to your point, I think the key is really to try and have an open mind and an open ear because we're continually learning about this. Those of us who've been trying to talk about this for 20 years have a lot to be surprised by. Uh, I have definitely been surprised in a very good way by the school strikes and Fridays for Future and the mobilization of youth around the world. Um, uh, I have been uh, surprised and pleased by some of the technological developments that we've seen. So I think there's a lot to hope for uh, in the conversations around climate change. Um, one of the ways to talk about climate change is definitely about generational uh, uh, implications or the, or the fact that the actions of past generations carry implications for future generations. That is definitely a part of the conversation. At the same time, I resist a little bit that as the defining framing, because it tends to lead people to think that this is a problem that can, we can uh, think about in the future, right? This is in a sense, okay, if we don't care so much about future generations, if we have to live in the moment, then maybe we don't have to think about this with the urgency uh, it deserves. And I think it's important to note that in some ways, well, first of all, that's morally a problematic position. But in addition, climate change is already with us. The implications are already there for current generations. And I think it's time to start realizing that. Uh, science has helped us a bit with this realization. There's this new literature on what is called the attribution of events, which says with some precision, how much, how certain can we be that a particular weather event, for example, is due to or has been made more likely because of climate change. Let me just do a little uh, uh, sidebar here. Last week, over the last two weeks um, in India, we had two cyclone events, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast. Now, East Coast cyclones are a long-standing phenomenon. West Coast cyclones are relatively new, right? And so the West Coast, this is off the, off the, uh, the, the Bombay coast, at the coast of Maharashtra. Um, Five of eight cyclones in the last uh, year or so have been from the West Coast. And that's because the Arabian Sea is heating up much faster 
in the Bay of Bengal. So the whole sort of meteorology of adverse weather effects in India has changed and is changing. And this is just, and this is a here and now issue. So I think we have to realize that the effects of past generations are affecting current generations too, and more so in highly vulnerable countries uh, like India that are poorer, less able to adapt and so on. So this is a complex conversation. And, and if there's one way in which we talk about the climate change that I would love to change is we talk about it in terms of a single dominant framing at a time, my way of looking at the problem or your way of looking at the problem. And in fact, we have to be able to sit comfortably with slightly different ways that are both true uh, or, or multiple ways that are all true and that are all differently relevant to different people. Uh, so in some cases, a net zero conversation that we need to move to net zero emissions, and we'll maybe talk about this later. In other places, uh, it's more about how you develop in ways that are as low carbon as possible. So we need to be elastic in our thinking and our, and our frameworks, and I hope we can uh, approach this conversation in that spirit. Yes, and I wouldn't wait for this, uh, actually, for later in the discussion. I would just jump into it uh, immediately, because what you're actually now mentioning is this uh, another conflict um, or, or, or um, a line, uh, and this is uh, this conversation about sustainability versus growth. So uh, we cannot we we cannot grow, uh, um, and then it's going to have an implication on uh, on, on our um, 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 GRP, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And on the other hand, we cannot be, be sustainable. We have to have net zero, etc. How do you see it, like from your perspective? Because it's uh, there is a certain implication of, you know, the, the country the, the countries that are uh, at the different development stage. Uh, um, are basically doomed to uh, uh, reach the same goals. Uh, mm -hmm. um, what what do you see? Uh, are what what is here the my, the main the main uh, thing that um, that you would like to address uh, in your research and your policy adv uh, yes. advices that you give to the government. So, so, uh, so look, you know, India, and maybe I'll, I'll start a little bit with an India specific point and then kind of expand out. India for a long time has had climate politics that have really been very strongly kind of adversarial north south based politics, right? You cause the problem, you deal with it. We have other issues to worry about, which we do. Uh, so when you guys have made some headway, come back to us. Um, and that has been, uh, in a sense, something that prevailed for over 20 years in the climate negotiations, it got a label, a legal label, and that was common, but differentiated responsibilities. That differentiation was really important. I think one of the signs of hope that I see is that for all sorts of reasons, that hard differentiation, that sense that developing countries can't do much about climate change until they develop to a certain point, I think that has become blurred a little bit, right? And it's become blurred for, for at least two or three reasons. One is just the way we talk and think about this. So you can make an interesting distinction between the responsibility for climate change, right? And responsibility to do something to address climate change. If you, if you strictly think about the responsibility for climate change, just from a numbers perspective, uh, US emissions, for example, are 20% of global emissions, Chinese emissions are 28%, Indian emissions are 7%, right? Uh, New Zealand emissions, of course, much smaller because it's a much smaller country. But if you look at it on a per person basis, the average American citizen emits eight times as much as the average Indian and the average German or New Zealander emits somewhere between four and five times the average Indian, right? And then yet another way of slicing it is how much have you contributed to the atmosphere overall, which is actually scientifically what matters. Over time, how much has a country contributed to the atmosphere? So most of the ways in which you slice this, you can't say that every country is equally responsible. So the responsibility for conversation led to this kind of dynamic. But when you move to responsibility two, it says, what can you do differently, given that there are vulnerable people in all countries, that we worry about future generations, and that has opened the door in India to a conversation that says, look, our development choices matter to the future of the globe. And the good news is we can make sensible development choices that help us as citizens, but also will help the globe. How we build our cities, and we'll talk about, for example, mobility 
um, how we address a problem like air pollution, which is killing people. Uh, uh, so some estimates, the Lancet says 80% of premature deaths in India are due to air pollution. A lot of what you would do to address that would also help climate change. So there's many things that we can do. And the drop in renewable energy prices uh, to where it's cost competitive with coal means that India now has a possibility of addressing climate change even as it develops. So these are all sort of good news stories. Is it going to be simple? Is it going to be easy? No. But coming back to the point I made earlier about how you talk about these things, I think what's really important globally is to understand that for a country like India, we are now politically in a position where we can talk about low carbon development pathways. How do you develop in low carbon ways? But if you ask Indians to talk about how do you get to net zero, which implies already reducing emissions, that's going to be a much harder challenge. And in the sense, it's not necessary because what India has to actually focus on is developing in a low carbon way. Right? So, that, so the, the way we talk about this matters. I, I think I, now I really, because you're, you're, talking about, you're talking about the responsibility uh, of each and every country and, uh, and um, um, the, the impact of new technologies, which, which some of them are maybe not there yet, or they are just coming and they need to be tested, uh, but on a, on a local, national way uh, or, or level. And um, now I, I really would like to ask Tobias, as a, a person who represents a, 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 glo a global uh, industry uh, or a, a company that is actually present all over the world, do you, and a person committed to, to green development, uh, uh, his own words, um, how do you approach it as a Volkswagen, as a company that has really, uh, is operating all over the world? How do you approach these differences uh, in the development in your strategies to reach your goals? And what are exactly these goals uh, um, uh, for, for Volkswagen? Yes, thank you for the question and also very happy to be with you. Um, we basically, like Renato said, we, we slice the topic um, accordingly. I think we're on the consensus of a, of a net CO2 neutral, at least at the latest by 2050. This is also the company has committed to um, publicly as one of the first major automakers. And then um, it's basically looking at all our, our um, footprint all over the world. If you, if you looked at um, Volkswagen um, for the passenger cars worldwide, we're talking about roughly 10 million cars. Uh, that are um, distributed to markets a year um, and you attribute what you introduced earlier the whole life cycle of the emissions so not only what our factories produce but also what is happening in the supply chain before and what is happening in the use case and of course these two later mentioned are much higher than what's our own own production and we look at that and see that as our responsibility also paradigm shift but necessary you can this accounts to one percent of global emissions so if you look, if you if, if, if Volkswagen were a state, it would rank as maybe UK probably um, as on rank 10th, yeah, with roughly 1% of global emissions. And so um, the what you see from that is the, the, the logic in which, we, which we're thinking is probably very compatible to what international politics and, and science um, is looking for. Um, and now um, the question also is up, how do we tackle this topic? Um, across the world regions in, a, in an appropriate way to have the differentiated approach. And um, Lavros, I know um, if we want to reach 2050 net zero, um, either every country and every company has to reach net zero, or if there are some who are later, which I would personally understand, of course, of the developing um, um, need of, of, of countries, for example, as India, that some countries have a later net zero um, uh, date. And China especially set already 2060. Um, so we need others to uh, be earlier. And this would be Germany now announced that they will be in 2045 net zero. I'm, Germany is a little bit smaller than China. So we need more of, uh, of uh, those countries to pitch in and be earlier. And the same debate happens um, within Volkswagen. If we actually look right now at the main three regions, it's China, Germany, uh, uh, U uh, the European Union, Germany, um, China and the US. And our most ambitious goal, of course, is within Europe. And we have now for the brand, at least, we don't have 
targets for each and everything yet defined. We have a goal of um, a minus 40% uh, CO2 emissions per car in 2030 compared to 18. And this is a, quite an ambitious, translates into a very ambitious uh, level. Whereas we see in China, the debate is, is a different one, for example. And the US, of course, will need to be front runner as well. Chloe, yeah. you want us to ask a question, of course. Yeah. Immediately. <laughs> yes, please. Um, kia ora, Tobias. Um, I'm really interested on, I mean, it was foreshadowed that you are really interested in green development per se, and in the context of a society and an economy that is seeking to distribute resources more equitably and ensure that everybody has access to education or otherwise, um, that makes sense to me. But in the context of a, a company, I'm really interested as to whether you see uh, sustainable or green development as interchangeable with the terminology of uh, sustainable growth per se, because this is a real conflict inside of uh, politics at present. And when we talk about things like GDP and the need to continue increasing transactions mm -hmm. and how we can do that through so-called weightless products or otherwise, um, I, I do have a level of, of cynicism for it. So just interested in, you know, when you're talking about that green development per se, does that involve a greater sense of product sovereignty and when you talk about things like the life cycle of a product does that include uh, considering increasing the life cycle of a product or building in costs of those what are otherwise externalities so that we have not the same sense of planned obsolescence where we have cars constantly churning through and a new one needed every other year. Mm -hmm. Okay, M many questions for the same. Yeah, <laughs> apologize. The, the, the latest, um, if we come to, um, oh, what would solve the problem right away is if people wouldn't own their car anymore. If you had, if you had a car fleet, if you have a, a digitally operated uh, clean car fleet um, where the manufacturer maybe is still the operator of this fleet and provides mobility to to urban, especially to urban dense cities where you can't have all these cars. Yeah, we were talking about the rural space, we, it's a different discussion, but let's focus on the urban space. Um, then, if, and this is actually a vision um, that is not so, um, so irrational. Um, it might be uh, there if we have the technology coming, we have the, the clean cars we already have, but the digital um, uh, connectivity um, to offer this in cities. Um, there's still um, some way to go. To maybe we're talking about autonomous driving, robot taxis, if you want, um, to offer mobility as a service in, in large areas. And once you have that, it's with your Xerox uh, printer um, that you, as in a company, you don't own it anymore, but the, 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 um, you get it uh, shifted and you only print per page. Yeah? So, um, of course, the manufacturer has an even a higher interest to have um, the long longevity of the product and keep that. But this is maybe far future. Um, coming back to today, um, the, the the plant obsolescence uh, I think is something um, you well, correct me if I'm wrong. You won't find in cars so much. Um, we we already we already um, always strive for more than 200 kilometers of of drive, and then it's more an economical question. If you prolong this car to 400,000, you won't have to put so much more money into it, um, which the customer again has to to pay for. And maybe in uh, after 200,000 kilometers, this is not the latest technology. So you actually want you want a, um, um, a renewal of this product. Of course, talking about recycling is then important um, to um, get, re get really have these these raw materials. Something we do with electric cars with a battery with a very big focus. I can't touch on that later. But I think um, from what I see, growth and sustainability, and this is basically the the question. We need to find something that is better, cleaner, and more attractive and cheaper as an alternative to what we have today uh, to convince the people. Um, because it's, it's not going to work if we, if we um, go and banning things, um, but we have to be innovative and creative and really um, show that it's possible. And I think the electric car actually is a very good example that it is possible. It will be cheaper. It will be cleaner. Um, it is um, actually uh, more fun to drive. Um, and here we have a good example, maybe it's not working everywhere, where, what, and this is what we should strive for. So not having a contradiction between sustainability and growth, but make it, make it go together, yes. So but Tobias, actually, basically what you're speaking about are, is our are changing uh, or the change of uh, pa uh, consumer patterns or yeah. Navros, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah I, so I wanted to ask you now to jump in. 
Yes, so so I think I think this is a it's a great conversation. I think uh, Chloe is is uh, onto something and correct when she points us to how these changes look from the perspective of a company and how they look from the perspective of a government or a state and and then separately obviously from a, a citizen and a consumer. I think what Tobias is saying, uh, which I which resonates with me very much, is uh, let's start thinking in terms of owning the distinction between owning a car and requiring a service, which is moving or mobility. And once you move to that mobility story, many more possibilities open up. Um, and as Katrina was saying, a lot of the discussion now around climate policy is saying, let's not only focus on how we supply energy in particular, because it's the biggest source of greenhouse gases, but also how we use energy. And if you shift about, shift how you use energy, a lot of more cost-effective options uh, open up. But I guess I would argue that, that maybe the shift that Tobias was, was talking about could be taken further. Once you move away from saying, we, you know, there's a cultural desire to own a car uh, in India, the, that the ladder is a cycle to a scooter to a car, you know, how do we break that, that sort of individual uh, uh, ladder of, of aspiration uh, to thinking about mobility? Um, you could go further from that and say, well, you could also change mobility needs by thinking about how you build cities, how you, how you construct livelihoods. And for a country like India, it's estimated that you know, 60% of India's building stock is yet to be built in its cities. We could actually redesign our cities that people have to move less uh, or you redesign cities to allow for non-motorized transport, cars and, uh, I'm sorry, walking in cycles and so on. So the degrees of freedom open up a lot more and for a co company like Volkswagen, it's sort of you can the, the business model allows some elasticity. You move from individually owned cars to basically uh, uh, autonomous driving and so on, still owned a, a service offered by a company. But when you look at it as a as a state uh, or, or as a citizens group, you actually wanted to move even further in ways that actually may not provide profit generating opportunities uh, for a company like Volkswagen. So I think, I think there's, you know, there's space. It's, it's great to actually see companies like Volkswagen entering this space, but I think it's also important to, to realize that, that as when you're thinking about public choices, you could frame this even more broadly in ways that would be even better for society, but that would reshape the opportunities uh, for companies. So I think we have to be open to that broader framing as well. And can you give an example, uh, Navras? Of yeah, so for, so, so for example, you know, you, you zone cities in ways where uh, uh, living and uh, uh, working accommodations are actually close by, right? In, in sort of in, in clusters. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you certainly design your cities with uh, cycle paths and, and, and walking paths and so on and so forth that allow for non-motorized transport to be much more accessible. These are the things that, that would shape your choices and how consumers think about things in the future. And if I may add on to that, I mean, this is a very live discussion uh, in New Zealand and in Auckland in particular, where in 2016, we passed the unitary plan at a local government level, which enabled far higher density and for more allocation of public transport in particular. But all of that higher density in turn means, of course, more people live in closer proximity to each other, which entails more small businesses cropping up, more amenities, and therefore starts to build neighborhoods if you're conscious about how you're developing therein. And I'm also really fascinated by that notion of the shared economy. I mean, to the point, uh, one of the more salient pieces of rhetoric that I've ever heard that I think encompasses all of these issues is that in a well-developed society, it isn't that every individual owns a car, even the poorest, it's that everybody, including the wealthiest, use public transport. So, you know, thinking about how we can have these kinds of public amenities that are brought together, and often at times when you think about needing to hit that critical mass, where things do become cheaper and more affordable, at times, particularly in smaller economies like in Aotearoa in New Zealand, it does require some level of government investment. So there's, a, yeah, a really fascinating mix of different levers that you can pull. It's a, it's a play of... Uh politics. Uh, we have here a uh, scientist, uh, you are as a politician, Chloe, and you, Tobias, as a uh, actually uh, person representing uh, industry. So, uh, uh, Tobias, I know that, you, that we are discussing uh, that there is a big discussion about fuel tax. 
Um, and I know that you have a certain uh, uh, view of uh, on, on it. Uh, so is fuel tax a solution? Um, or do you see it, uh, what, what are the what is the frame? What what needs to be done to uh, to for it to become a solution? Okay, um, you refer to uh, putting a price on CO two. Um, yes, 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 yes. But earlier talking about um, setting goals for the world, for the world regions, for industries, for 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 companies, and the question is how can government best ensure that um, these goals are reached. And um, as a business uh, representative, of course, um, we always try to be cost effective. And I think the debate is, uh, is there at large as well. And um, so, um, and just to mention 20 years, nearly 20 years ago, I wrote my thesis already on, on uh, the topic of emission trading. And, and what really convinced me and is still the idea of the day, I think, is to use market forces to make environmental problems um, be solved. So putting a, putting a price on CO2 really as the number one um, effective lever um, would be interesting if you, see, if you see this not as a priority one, um, I think is, is vital. And if we come back to the, to the conflict and to the, to the generational debate, um, this is um, an intergenerational issue, but it's also an intragenerational issue. And not only between the developed world and the developing world, but also within a, in, within a country, let's take Germany, um, where you have, um, after all, now these ambitious goals, let's say 2045, we want to be net zero, who's going to pay for what's necessary? And if you don't, if you want to use this mechanism, which is actually ensuring that um, people make price decisions um, for, for purchasing, having CO2 in mind because it's in included, because CO2 um, has a price and uh, makes things more expensive that are more, more dirty, um, you will hurt those who um, have less money. Yeah? So any, any welfare, um, welfare recipient has a wonderful CO2 footprint. It's probably um, can, can uh, compete with an Indian level, not even, not quite, but in compared to those who have the money, the rich, um, the rich middle class um, who can um, spend much more money and therefore consume more and therefore have a higher CO2 footprint, it would be unfair if, if the daily um, right to work, if the power at home, if the heating, um, this is something everybody needs. And for a poorer household, this would, of course, be much more um, um, relevant in, in terms of percentage. So what is so important is that the money um, that government um, earns by putting a price on CO2 is giving, given back to the people um, that have uh, little income. And actually, this is a hot debate um, around at the moment. Once we have the targets, how do we achieve it? And is this an instrument? What are the instruments? And I think this is very vital um, to um, also have the, always have the social component uh, when discussing prices on CO2, otherwise um, there, it's, it's, not, it's unfair and it's, it's not environment or social, um, social coherence, but it's both at once, of course, and that's the way we want to go. Yeah. So basically you're yeah. talking the, the, it's like the global north and global south, the responsibilities should be differentiated or developing countries and the countries that are already developed. Uh, so the same goes for the society itself. Uh, you have uh, people who are, uh, uh, much more uh, CO2 uh, uh, consumers uh, or producers than uh, the other uh, sectors of the society or groups in the society. And then you have to do rest redistribute. And basically it's a policy issue. Um, it should be in a way regulated by the politics, but Navros. Yeah, so, so, so I think Tomas is right to draw attention uh, uh, to this. And it, it, of course, is it's quite complicated. So, for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, low-income households in the U.S. Uh, will typically may, in fact, have quite a high carbon footprint because they typically can only afford older, dirtier cars, right? And so, a a carbon tax might actually end up uh, hitting them harder uh, than it would hit uh, wealthier people. Uh, so, and and and. On the other hand, in other, in other places, low-income households will have smaller energy use. They might be using, in India, they might be using non-commercial fuel, in other words, firewood, and so they wouldn't see the impact of that carbon tax. So it differs uh, place to place. But the broader point that any climate policy 
you need to think about the distributional impact is really important. But let me take that conversation in two further directions. One is that, you know, increasingly we have no idea how to draw a circle around what we call climate policy. We just talked about how urban planning might be a climate policy. In India, thinking about agriculture and resilient forms of agriculture is a climate policy. So the distinction between climate and non-climate policy is, is, meaning, is increasingly meaningless. It's about how do you inject thinking about climate change within every aspect of, 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 of decision making. And that's, that's the way in which we're approaching it in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for this next uh, uh, report that is coming out in a, in a couple of years. The second thing is, so, so one the sort of boundary between climate and non-climate policy is a very fuzzy one. The second thing is increasingly policymakers need to be thinking about putting different policies together as packages. So you have one particular thing that you do to incentivize reduction in emissions, another that makes sure that the poor are not hurt. A third policy com component might be to encourage experimentation or putting out more information in the public domain. So information policies, you know, getting companies to report on the greenhouse gas implications of what they do, making sure that investors have a good idea about uh, uh, whether or not uh, certain investments take into account the risk of climate change. Arguably, coal and oil companies have begun feeling the impact of future climate policy because they've been forced to disclose whether or not they are exposed to these risks in the future. So, uh, so, these, so, so thinking about climate policy in a much more expansive way, right? So we have to take mm -hmm. distribution into account. We can do it by combining policies and we need to, in a sense, mainstream uh, thinking about climate into, uh, into uh, a whole range of policy arenas. So basically you say every policy is a climate policy, no matter if it's uh, thought as a climate policy or it is not, uh, uh, you know, people didn't think about it in the yeah. stems, but it end, ends up uh, as a climate policy. Yeah, I think, the, I think uh, you know, politicians like Chloe have a really important role here to ask those questions. When you bring something to me, have you thought about what it means for climate? I mean, and, and some things will mean more, some things will mean less, but you have to ask that question. And governments have to build the institutional machinery to ask that question. Mm. And, and Chloe uh, asked this question because she even started uh, asking the uh, uh, New Zealand government about where does the government invest? <laughs> oh, yes, no, absolutely. So yeah, I, I have a member's bill um, presently drafted to require the government uh, and all state-owned enterprises to uh, completely remove itself from any investment in climate-related risk. Because as far as I can see, it, it makes next to no sense for us to be banking on the climate crises effectively. But to Navros's point, um, you know, when you're talking actually about a country as arguably small um, as Aotearoa New Zealand in terms of uh, what we contribute to the uh, kind of emissions globally, I believe off the top of my head at 0.2%. But if you add up all of the countries that do contribute under 0.2%, it's 20% of global emissions. But far more importantly, and what I, as you know, a member of the party that I am, but also as one of the younger members, I'm consistently trying to drive home the fact that if a relatively wealthy country, but particularly one that has such high per capita emissions, mm. can't get it right, how do we on earth try and ensure or use our place in the international community to try and drive others to get it right? On top of that, uh, you know, I was in the UK as part of a, a kind of group of Environment Select Committee members of Parliament that went across uh, to evaluate how well or poorly, uh, you know, to learn some lessons from uh, 10 years on from the Climate Change Act 2008 out of the UK, which established a similar framework to what we have with the Zero Carbon Act, where you set up a framework to get to carbon neutrality by 2050, to lock in 1.5 degrees or below of warming, and you institute a independent climate change commission to offer the government advice to get there with carbon budget every few years. And one of the fascinating uh, pieces of advice or perhaps warning that we received from uh, the politicians and the officials and the advisors in the UK was that the challenges that we would face in New Zealand were the really hard stuff really quickly because we didn't have that same lower hanging fruit in the form of energy production. You know, a huge swath of our energy is already produced uh, by natural means. 
In fact, the hardest thing that we had to deal with first was food production because over half of our emissions domestically are produced by virtue of agriculture. And that's why we've been the first country in the world to move towards integrating the agricultural sector into the emissions trading scheme. And uh, my co-leader and our climate change minister, James Shaw, has instituted a huge amount of work over the past two years in particular to get us to that point in time. But I think the point that we've reached, right, because something like food is not just a, a kind of environmental factor or something that we need to take into account when we talk about climate change. It's also something that we need to take into account when we talk about social distribution, because it's one of those things that everybody also happens to need. <laughs> So when we're talking about these policies and we say, you know, we're going to draw a circle, as Navroz said, it's in fact that we have to draw a circle around the entire economy, because what is the economy, if not as it's defined as all of us and the things that we produce? And that, to me, takes us to different ways of economic thinking or economic models. Mm -hmm. And you've seen in some, you know, relatively recent works, the likes of Kate Raworth's Donut Economics, or, you know, in Tom R. Paikadi's thinking about uh, distribution economically, uh, all of these ways of thinking are starting to drive home something that both trade unionists and Indigenous climate activists brought to the fore in the notion of the just transition not all too long ago. The just transition wasn't just thinking about how we so-called green our economy and how we keep this uh, kind of inequality that we have entrenched, whether that is domestically or internationally but actually how we move towards a society where more people have a greater sense of economic equality. And it also happens that in getting there, we manage to reduce our carbon emissions. And through the likes of the emissions trading scheme, as Tobias has outlined, but paired with those redistributive schemes that Navroz has outlined, uh, that's the only way that we can really get there. And that's why at present in Aotearoa, New Zealand, there are some really heated discussions about the likes of guaranteed minimum income, for example. Mm. But basically, when we when we look at it, it's um, I mean everything is climate policy and um, um, and the impact uh, um, um, of any policies uh, or or any action uh, by industries by by uh, civil society it's, it has an impact on the on the climate. We have to finish now. We are already over our time. But I just wanted to tell you that. Um, um, at the end, um, I hope that some of these ideas will uh, be discussed at the COP uh, uh, in Glasgow uh, this year, and that uh, maybe we will have another step in um, what I see here in this discussion as a, a cooperation and a very strong cooperation between the, the industries, between the politics and between uh, um, science. And, um, and that's in a way, uh, the way to think about the future. Um, but the future is now, as you said, Navros, uh, rightly so. So uh, with this, I end uh, here. And thank you very much for this uh, fascinating uh, thoughts. Um, thank you for being with us uh, in Weimar, but digital. Yeah.